Throughout their long history, the Romans never had a shortage of enemies. In this list, there are 10 names, but I could have just as easily put another 10 historical figures on this list. Like Archimedes, who is not on this list. Why, you ask? Because he was just a guy doing his job, utilizing his mathematical brilliance to defend his city-state. There's no great foe in that, even if his inventions were something quite brilliant. And no, for the record, I don't buy Archimedes having invented a death ray. That sounds absurd. What about Spartacus? Nope. A slave rebellion, as big as it was, doesn't quite compare to this lot. Alaric? He sacked Rome, after all. Also nope. His sack was incredibly tame and derived almost exclusively for political reasons. Genseric's sack, for comparison, was worse. And guess what? He isn't in this top 10 either. Neither is Boudicca. They all remain as honorable mentions, though. Once again, no beezies. Number 10, Viriathus. This is a name often unnoticed in the history of Rome. Viriathus was a Lusitanian leader who would ultimately lead a significant coalition against the Romans. This conflict is known as the Lusitanian War or the War of Fire. A bit of a Sertorius before Sertorius, Viriathus often engaged in hit and run and ambush tactics repeatedly defeating the Romans on the battlefield and forcing them to, temporarily, sign a peace treaty, which also recognized Viriatus as an ally of the Roman people. This deal, however, was deemed unacceptable by the Romans, so one of the Roman commanders, Quintus Servilius Scipio, bribed three men close to the Lusitanian leader to assassinate him, which they did, leaving the Lusitanian resistance without a leader. In a small moment of karma, when the three men returned to collect their payment for doing the deed, they weren't given anything, as Caipio told them, Rome does not pay traitors. With the death of Viriatus, the Lusitanian resistance had lost a leader they could count on. Though they kept resisting under a new leader, Tautilus, they were quickly defeated by the Romans. Viriatus remained as the most successful leader to have ever opposed Roman encroachment in Iberia. Number 9. Vercingetorix From one regional resistance leader to another, Vercingetorix is definitely more famous than Viriatus, even if that is only because Vercingetorix's Roman foe was one Gaius Julius Caesar. Picked out by the various Gallic chieftains to lead Gaul's resistance against Caesar, it is through Caesar's victory Vercingetorix is known for. While he couldn't exactly defeat Caesar, he did make his life difficult, employing a scorched earth strategy to deny Caesar and his legions of supplies, which may have worked had Vercingetorix been more cruel and allowed Avericum to be raised. Since he chose not to, the Roman legions eventually captured the settlement, winning themselves some vital food and, well, slaughtering some 40,000 people. Vercingetorix would then defeat Caesar in the Battle of Jergovia, but everything culminated in the Battle of Alesia, one of the most insane battles in history, which Caesar won. And with that victory, Vercingetorix himself was captured and the Gallic Rebellion was practically crushed. Number 8. Mithridates VI If there's one ruler who proved to be a constant headache to the Romans, it's Mithridates. The King of Pontus was truly the last Greek effort against Roman dominance. It took the Romans not one, not two, but three wars to defeat him for good. And even then, that still wasn't enough to kill him. It had to be a rebellion from one of his sons to finally drive him to commit suicide. Now, one has to consider the fact. For as long as Mithridates lived, Rome was not exactly politically stable, given all the civil wars and purges going on. This was actually the biggest reason why Mithridates became such a thorn on the Roman side. At the height of his power, Mithridates had control over all of Anatolia and pretty much the entirety of the Black Sea. Throughout his struggle against Rome, among his enemies include Sulla, Lucullus, Marina, and Pompey the Great. Quite a star-studded cast. Number 7. Shapur II Shapur the Great, as that is also what he's known as, was a Sassanid emperor. Originally, he wasn't even hostile to the Romans, but when Constantine the Great would change all that, as he declared his empire would be the defender of all Christians, including those in Persia. It also didn't help Constantine had written in his will one of his nephews, Hannibalianus, was to be declared King of Kings and defender of all Christians in the East, an obvious provocation to Shapur II. From that point onwards, Shapur II would spend much of his reign fighting wars against the Romans, on and off. 
He kept those hostilities against Constantius II and then against Julian, where he managed an impressive victory, which granted the undoing of the humiliating peace of Nisibis and the return of the lands lost in that treaty. So ultimately, he actually succeeded. He never stopped being hostile to some degree to the Romans either. What's curious about Shapur II is his overall demeanor, which depended on the proximity of a nearby imperial army, in other words, an army led by a Roman emperor. If it was far away, Shapur II acted pretty much as if he ruled the place. Then, when met by a proper Roman response, his stance would shift to, now hold on, let's talk about this. The man was just a headache to deal with, primarily for this reason. Neither Constantius II, Julian or Valens, the three Roman emperors who dealt the most with him, ever fully trusted him, mostly for this reason. As soon as they settled for something and turned away to deal with another problem, there he was, stirring up trouble again. Number 6. Pyrrhus of Epirus I won't be talking much about Pyrrhus of Epirus. For the time I'm writing this video, I am also writing another one which talks about Pyrrhus at a far greater length. What you need to know about him is as follows. Great general, terrible diplomat, chip on his shoulder, unbelievably ambitious. One of the greatest generals of his age, Antigonus the One-Eyed, actually looked at Pyrrhus and said he'd be the greatest general of his time if he lived long enough, which Pyrrhus did. Under the pretense of saving a small Greek city-state from the Romans, Tarentum, Pyrrhus hopped on a few ships alongside his armies and sailed to Italy. There he'd meet the Romans in battle. The Romans had undergone through a significant military transformation where they abandoned the Greek phalanx in favor of a new system called the Manipal, which really basically was a phalanx but quite a bit more flexible. And the Romans had that. Pyrrhus had elephants. Elephants stomped on Manipal. Manipal dead. So the Romans were stomped the first time they faced Pyrrhus on the battlefield. The Battle of Heraclea was unquestionably a victory for Pyrrhus. Second time was the Battle of Asculum. This time the Romans had some wagons made to stop the elephants charging and almost succeeded in doing so. Except this is war and almost doesn't count, so they lost. But they had managed to inflict quite a significant number of casualties this time around. Pyrrhus even said another victory like this and he was done for. The Battle of Asculum was a Pyrrhic victory. Get it? Pyrrhic, victory, Pyrrhus, you see, yeah, I'll just stop. Still, Pyrrhus was great at helping the Romans figure out how to deal with elephants. Next battle on the cards was Beneventum and the Romans won, even capturing a few of the elephants, though that wasn't the sole reason why they won. Number 5, Attila the Hun. Now this is the point where we're beginning to reach the heavies, those historical figures who carry quite a bit of weight into their name. They either drove the Romans to fear or to seething hatred. I believe it's fitting we start with the Scourge of God, Attila the Hun. The ruler of the Huns throughout the 5th century, Attila demonstrated just how fearsome the Huns were when he and his army chose to cross the Danube and, to put it bluntly, annihilated pretty much everything in its path on the way to Constantinople. The only reason why he didn't take Constantinople was because the city was pretty much impregnable. Then he turned on the west, where he and the Roman general Flavius Aetius gathered massive coalitions of barbarians before facing each other in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, where Attila... lost? He didn't exactly take it very well. Next up, he invaded Italy and ravaged the south, only to be stopped by the Pope, who probably bribed him to go somewhere else. He was preparing for another campaign in the east, and then he died. Probably due to internal bleeding. A little anticlimactic. Number 4. Arminius From the Germanic perspective, Arminius is a hero. From the Roman one, a traitor. A byproduct of the conquest of Germania, Arminius was born a Cherusci prince, and being a part of the faction of the tribe, which was friendly to Rome, he spent much of his time in the Roman military, which would acquire him a Roman citizenship and the rank of Equites. He would serve Rome in the Great Illyrian Revolt with distinction, and soon after he was sent to Germania to aid the governor Publius Quintilus Varus in completing the conquest of the region for good. In reality, however, Arminius took this opportunity to scheme against the Romans. Knowing that, on equal terms, the Germanic warriors were no match for the Romans, he ensured when the two sides met 
they would not be on equal footing. His scheming culminated in the Battle of the Tudelberg Forest, where the three legions led by Varus were ambushed and killed. Though this eventually led to a punitive expedition led by Germanicus, which will lead to catastrophic defeats and eventually the assassination of Arminius, it was a turning point in the history of Rome. With this battle, the imperial borders in Europe would be firmly situated in the Rhine and the Danube rivers, as ordered by Augustus. The only ones to break this were Trajan and Constantine in the Danube. In the Rhine frontier, however, the Germans were here to stay, and some 400 years later, they would play their part in the fall of Rome. Number 3. Brennus Maybe the most unknown figure on this list. Who exactly is Brennus? Why, Brennus is the first barbarian leader to have sacked Rome, of course. He was the leader of the Senones who defeated the Romans in the Battle of the Allia, and later besieged the city. The Romans eventually relented and agreed to pay Brennus and his men to just go away. Brennus famously tipped the scales with a sword, uttering Vai Victis, meaning Woe to the Conquered. Brennus's mark on the history of Rome is Gargantuan. The sack of Rome was a major event in the history of the city-state, as that was the moment Rome transformed from a mere Italian city-state to the Roman Republic that would never give up in the face of catastrophe that later faced and defeated the Samnites, Hannibal, and the Greeks. As for the Romans themselves, well, the Gauls would have a profound effect on the Roman psyche that wouldn't be healed until the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar. Number 2. Shapur I Shapur II may have been a major headache to the Romans, but Shapur I was an existential threat to the entire Roman East. For years, as the Roman Empire was pretty much falling apart, facing god knows how many civil wars and endless barbarian invasions, welcome to the 3rd century, Shapur I had essentially a free hand in the East, facing numerous wars against the Romans. He first ensured Armenia would remain under Persian influence, then in the next war he penetrated deep into Syria, capturing Antioch before Valerian arrived and the two engaged in campaign. Shapur would win and capture Valerian, the first time a Roman emperor was captured in battle. Shapur II would almost certainly have captured the bulk of the Roman East had it not been for Septimius Odenathus, the king of Palmyra who saved the increasingly hopeless situation, defeating Shapur I in battle and ensuring the East would remain under Roman protection. This all the while the actual sitting emperor Gallienus was busy in Europe dealing with all the revolts and barbarian invasions he faced. Number 1. Hannibal Barca A little obvious, yes, but when you think enemy of Rome, the first person to come into your mind is probably Hannibal. Hell, he even swore an oath of vengeance as a child, and spent almost the entirety of his life opposing Rome in some form or another. It all started as soon as the Romans signed a treaty with Saguntum, violating a treaty they had signed with the Carthaginians over both states' spheres of influence in Spain. Hannibal responded by sieging and plundering the city. As soon as Rome declared war, the man picked his army, traveled through the Alps into Italy and delivered the Romans three crushing defeats, the last one so bad the Romans were desperate enough to commit actual human sacrifices. Following that, he spent the next 15 years in Italy ravaging the countryside, largely unimpeded, because most saw a direct confrontation with Hannibal a suicide. Circumstances elsewhere would eventually drive him out of Italy and back to Africa, where he would be defeated by Scipio Africanus, but he didn't stop opposing the Romans there. After trying out in politics and escaping Roman wrath by fleeing the East, Hannibal spent the rest of his life in foreign kingdoms, most notably in the court of the Seleucid Emperor Antiochus, who gave Hannibal command over a fleet where he would be defeated again, this time by Scipio's brother. The Romans hated him to the point he had to kill himself to avoid capture. His final words were, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. And that's the list. Hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like, comment, and if you aren't subscribed, then please do so. I'd really appreciate it. I've opened up a Patreon account, so if you'd like to support me there, there's a link in the description below. This was Spectrum, and I hope you have a fantastic time.